Welcome to LA Controversial, your behind the scenes tour of the more colorful side of life in the limelight. In the world of athletics, few have flown faster down the home straight than former Olympic champion Marion Jones. In the 100 and 200 meters finals at the Sydney Olympics in 2000, her phenomenal speed left all comers eating her dust. And with a record-breaking medal tally of three gold and two bronze, she was the runaway star of the games. The golden girl from LA had the world at her feet as the undisputed queen of track and field. However, that title came with its fair share of rumors that she'd had more than a little help from her performance-enhancing friends. But while many of her fellow competitors were falling foul of random drug tests, Marion's negative results backed up her regular assertions that she was the paragon of athletic virtue. I've never taken a performance-enhancing drug, and I never will. It's as simple as that. I have never, ever failed a drug test. I have taken over 160 drug tests. I have taken tests before, during, and after the 2000 Olympics and have never failed a test. The same could not be said of her shot putter husband, CJ Hunter. When he got busted in Sydney, she played the supportive wife and accompanied him to his humiliating news conference. And I am here pretty much to show my complete support for my husband. Um, aside from him being an athlete and me being an athlete, he's my husband and I'm here to show support for him. As the number of athletes caught cheating around her escalated, so did the boldness of Marion's statements. The only thing I really didn't like, and I'll be truthful with this, is the fact that, um, you know, USADA commented that, uh, they commended um, her courageous act by admitting that she tested positive, and you know I, I don't I don't understand how you how you can commend that and and the fact that she admitted she's courageous. If someone close to her had reminded her of the old adage, the harder they come, the harder they fall, perhaps she would have thought twice about sticking her head quite so high above the parapet, especially in light of the ongoing investigation into the operations of Bay Area Laboratory Cooperative, which later became known as the Balco Affair. The net began to close in on Balco and the athletes to whom it had secretly been supplying performance-enhancing drugs. With Balco well and truly on the ropes, founder and owner Victor Conti pointed both fingers at Marion, who continued to tough it out in front of a grand jury. But World Anti-Doping Agency Chief Dick Pound wasn't convinced. The position she's taken is that she's absolutely pure. If it turns out that that's wrong, her whole performance will be seen as a complete charade. And uh, I think the, the public will be very disappointed. Young people will be particularly disappointed because there is somebody who would have has evaporated right in front of their eyes. Marion just kept on running, but in October 2007, it all caught up with her. The overwhelming evidence against her included her ex-husband's testimony that she'd injected her own stomach in the Olympic Village, and Marion finally fessed up to two counts of perjury and admitted using steroids both before and after her historic haul in Sydney. Outside the courtroom, she faced the public. I want you to know that I have been dishonest. And you have the right to be angry with me. After nearly a decade of ducking and diving, she had finally got her guilty secret off her chest. She was stripped of her medals and began a six-month sentence in a Texas prison. Completing her fall from grace, the former media darling was also convicted of lying about her involvement in a check fraud scandal. And after her release from prison in September 2008, one of sport's first female millionaires admitted she was flat broke. Now playing professional basketball in the WNBA with the Tulsa Shock, Marion has been forced to start at the bottom, earning a rather modest $35,000 per season. The oldest of the four acting Baldwin brothers, Alec, was the first to become a professional actor and to this day remains the most successful and well-known. 
Alex's career began on television soaps, but minor roles in late 80s movies like Working Girl and Beetlejuice soon saw him raising his profile internationally. In recent years, he's become known for his strong character roles in films like The Cooler and TV shows like Will and & Grace and 30 Rock. Unfortunately, however, he has become just as well known for his personal strife. In 2002, an acrimonious divorce from actress Kim Basinger after eight years of marriage led to bitter fighting in the courts, especially over custody arrangements for their daughter Ireland. It all got even uglier in 2007, when a tape was released of Alec leaving Ireland an extremely angry voicemail for failing to answer a pre-arranged phone call. His use of the expression, thoughtless little pig, in regard to his 11-year-old daughter was especially contentious. While I heard Mr. Baldwin's voice message uh, and was saddened by what he had to say, I also heard the extreme pain that he's gone through as a father uh, who's being abandoned by his daughter and being abused by the system. Alec immediately apologized for his outburst and reportedly begged producers of 30 Rock to let him out of his contract to devote time to parental issues. The controversy certainly didn't help Alec's cause in his child custody battle with Kim, but he wasn't without his supporters. Outside court at a scheduled custody hearing, there were plenty of people barracking for Alec. Well, what's really interesting to me about this case is the fact that the media got so preoccupied with what Mr. Baldwin said and seemingly showed no interest in the 12 contempt charges on the other side of the fence. Had the court stepped in and sanctioned on the first or, and or second contempt charge, we wouldn't be here today. But courts do not sanction parents who alienate their children from the other parent, particularly if it's the mother. The following year, Alec wrote a book called A Promise to Ourselves, which followed his seven-year custody battle with Kim, claiming that she had made every effort to cut him out of their daughter's life and that he'd finally snapped. He has since admitted to Playboy magazine that he considered suicide in the wake of the leaked voicemail and subsequently sought professional help. Constantly surrounded by packs of snap-happy photographers, pop princess Britney Spears probably gets to spend more quality time with members of the paparazzi than she does with her kids. The girl has no peace. She is constantly in the news. She can't do anything. She can't go anywhere without people just hounding her. And this has got to take a terrible toll. Sometimes they've got a little too close for comfort and suffered the painful consequences, like when Brittany accidentally drove over a few protruding feet in her hurry to get away. Not that the danger to life and limb has slowed them down. And why should it? This golden goose of a former teen queen has laid more than enough golden eggs to soothe the aches and pains of a few broken bones. Given Britney's headline-hogging stunts of the past few years, it's easy to forget that in the early days of her marriage to Kevin Federlein, it was K-Fed's wayward ways that were making the news. In 2005, reports of the dancers' hard partying and womanizing were splashed across the gossip pages leaving Britney home alone. That Kevin loves to go out and party. He'll hang out with his friends till all hours. He'll bring people back to the house. And he has been spotted frequently hanging out with strippers and girls at clubs. Fans and commentators were very vocal in their insistence she dumped the love rat, who was frittering away her fortune with little regard for the bad press. Feel free to hate on me. You know, if you have no one to hate, feel free to hate on me because I think Haters are, are motivators. You know, you can't really get anywhere without somebody gawking at you or, or, you know, nitpicking at what you do. But by February of the next year, just a month after giving birth to her first baby, Sean Preston, Brittany had begun compiling her own impressive catalog of gaffes and bungles, sparking an unprecedented feeding frenzy among celebrity photographers and gossip columnists. Her increasingly bizarre behavior began ringing alarm bells for anyone with an ounce of compassion or medical know-how. It's quite possible it could be a breakdown. It's quite possible it could be drugs. There are features of both the erratic behavior, the poor judgment, uh, the 
inviting attention uh, is a cry for help, it seems like. And it could be a number of things, uh, but certainly those would be at the top of the list about what could be driving this type of behavior. Two months after driving with Sean Preston in her lap, she allegedly received a visit from child welfare officials who were following up on reports that Sean had fallen out of a high chair and cracked his skull. Not long after that, she was snapped almost dropping him as she emerged from the Ritz-Carlton with a drink in one hand. Amid rumors that her marriage to KFED was all but over, she announced she was pregnant again. Then came the dyed black hair, the pregnant nude photo, and shots of her picking out on snacks and chocolate. By the time Jaden James came along in September 2006, Brittany's grip on reality looked shaky to say the least. Two months later, she filed for divorce from Kevin, and the unraveling began in earnest. And who knows what Brittany's are? Could be something from her childhood. Could be some kind of issue that she's currently involved with that she can't stand, and she uses drugs to cope with it. Hitting the L.A. party circuit with Paris Hilton just days after filing for divorce, Brittany has since claimed that her wild behavior was a direct result of the grief she felt at parting from Kevin. And she certainly didn't do her grieving quietly. Photos of her in various stages of undress and intoxication became staple front page fare for gossip mags. She was voted worst celebrity role model in an AP AOL news poll. She tied with Paris for the number one spot on Blackwell's annual worst dress list and topped the year off by collapsing at Pure Nightclub on New Year's Eve. Incredibly, she still had further to fall. In February 2007, after spending less than 24 hours in rehab, she checked herself out again and embarked on the high-speed extreme makeover that proved to all and sundry she totally lost the plot. After a Californian hairdresser refused her request to shave her head, Brittany grabbed hold of the clippers herself and performed her own buzz cut before dashing round to the local tattoo parlor for some needlework. Within the week, she was back in rehab. Brittany Spears' prognosis, unless she gets the right kind of treatment, is dire. Her situation is most likely going to escalate. You know, she cut off her hair. She got a tattoo. Well, you know, they're forms of mutilation. Some people carry it further and they actually cut themselves. And wherever she's going, if they're treating her for mutilation or alcoholism or addiction, it's totally off the path. They have nothing to do with it. They are merely coping mechanisms. Brittany is using them to try and cope with her out-of-control life. In October 2007, Kevin was granted physical custody of Sean Preston and Jaden James. Meanwhile, Brittany was ordered to undergo random tests for drugs and alcohol. And her spectacular rate of self-combustion was documented in an exhibition in LA. Some commentators were already reading the last rites. Losing your kids and also in a very public way is traumatic uh, for anybody. And for a mother, uh, I, I, can, I can't even understand the, how it would feel because there's a whole different bond there than being a father. My hope is, and from people I've talked to, she's very fragile emotionally. I hope this doesn't send her over the edge. While her attorney was being paid to give a more positive spin. I believe that removing custody from Ms. Spears is the shock treatment that Britney Spears needs. And in January 2008, she had to be carted away to hospital for psychiatric evaluation before her father, Jamie, finally stepped in to pick up the pieces. As well as hiring a sobriety coach, he shielded her from former manager Sam Lufty and mounted a gargantuan effort to get Britney back on her feet. Miraculously, by September, she'd won Video of the Year for her single Piece of Me and had announced the release date of her sixth studio album, Circus, and its lead single, Womanizer, which jumped straight to number one on the Billboard Hot 100. She solidified the comeback with a second consecutive number one single and a number one album. She looked in great shape as she posed for the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. And although she did cop a fair amount of flack for miming during her stage shows, her hardcore fans were more than happy with her performance. The theatrics, the performance, I mean, it was just, it was great. The stage show was she, great. The stage, stage show was amazing. 
phenomenal. So is Brittany back? It was definitely a circus. <laughs> it was awesome. She's, back, <laughs> She's definitely I'm back. back. When it comes to formidable female screen images, the dames from the 30s and 40s were pretty hard to beat. With their shoulder pads, severe hairstyles and lipstick slashed mouths, they were a match for even their toughest male counterparts, like Humphrey Bogart, James Cagney and Edward G. Robinson. One of the most intimidating was Barbara Stanwyck whose long Hollywood career saw her take on a number of defining roles in films like Double Indemnity, The Lady Eve, and Walk on the Wild Side. But when it came to conjuring up the nerves of steel required for those sorts of femme fatale, Barbara had a deep well of personal experience to draw from. She was born Ruby Catherine Stevens in 1907 and raised in Brooklyn because that's where her father Byron ran to the first time he abandoned her mother Catherine and their children. Then, when she was just three years old, her mother, who was pregnant again, was pushed off a tram by a drunk and killed. Instead of looking after his children, Byron effectively made them orphans by deserting them and disappearing to the Panama Canal Zone. Steening herself against the rejection and abandonment, Ruby was hired as a dancer and her entry into show business was sealed with her appearance in the hit play The Noose in 1926. Her rave reviews for that and another show burlesque led to her new name, Barbara Stanwyck, and a Hollywood screen test for her first film, Broadway Nights. She played a small role as a fan dancer, having lost out on the lead when she was unable to cry during the screen test. It was one of the many acting skills she would perform with ease in later years. But at that time in her life, she simply had no tears available. Maybe she'd learned from the earliest age that they would get her nowhere. Sheer grit was what she needed, and that's what she had in abundance. Haley Joel Osment made his debut in front of the camera when he was just four years old, after trying out for a Pizza Hut commercial in a shopping mall in LA. He went on to play Tom Hanks' son in Forrest Gump and played a string of sickly children in various TV shows before landing the role of the kid who saw dead people in the M. Night Shyamalan chiller The Sixth Sense, which earned him a Saturn Award for Best Young Actor as well as an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor. Everyone fell in love with this series a sweet kid who at the tender age of 11 appeared to have it all worked out. I can't say it enough. He's so brilliant, so brilliant, so brilliant. And he's so mature and unbelievably professional. We all learned a thing or two from him. Um, and he was just always there. I mean, so consistent. I, I, I gather usually with kids, you're kind of trying to snatch and grab moments of, of some sort of real spark that they get going, but he was just so in control. He certainly seemed wise beyond his years when it came to tackling the challenge of playing a boy tormented by ghosts. It was like living a nightmare for Cole. Um, I, after reading the script so much, you have to you have to run through everything that's in Cole's mind over and over, and uh, you just have to to know that look in the mirror and you see Cole. It's you have to be him. You're not you're not Haley anymore. You're Cole and. Uh, um, you have to live what he's living. Despite his obvious intelligence and maturity, like so many other child stars who were forced to grow up too soon, Haley was destined to take a walk on the wild side. Seven years later, at the age of 18, Haley's car careered into a mailbox and overturned in Flint Ridge, California, on the way to LA. After being carted off to hospital with a broken rib and concussion, he was found to be carrying marijuana. A blood alcohol test produced a reading of 0.16, which would have been twice the legal limit had he actually been old enough to be drinking in the first place. He pleaded no contest to the charges of driving under the influence of alcohol and being in possession of marijuana, and was sentenced to three years probation and 60 hours in a rehabilitation program. Thankfully, that bang on the head seemed to have knocked some sense into him. Since then, Haley has got back on track with roles in Home of the Giants, Montana Amazon, 
and truth and treason. Sharon Stone's spot on LA Controversial was reserved the moment she uncrossed her legs under cross-examination in the steamy psychological thriller Basic Instinct back in 1992. But over the past few years, the femme fatale has been raising temperatures for very different reasons. Famous for her talent for pulling in the big bucks for charity, she got a little ahead of herself at the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2007, after hearing Tanzania's president's pleas for donations to buy much-needed malaria nets. Uh, enjoyed being here in uh, Davos. It's very new to me and very moving to me. Um, and I just feel like it might, it's very moving and it right, might really amount to something. And I was particularly moved by President Nkapa and by his urgent need of today. Um, so if you don't mind, I'd like to offer my help and support to you. She got the impromptu fundraiser off to a flying start. And I'd like to offer you $10,000 to help buy you some bed nets today. And would, um, my honor, would anyone else <laughs> like to be on a team with me and stand up and offer some money and help him as well? 50,000. 50,000. 50, Thank you. Would anyone else like to stand up <laughs> and help President Nkapa today? You. We could give this money to the Global Health Fund for AIDS, TB, and malaria. And I think they may need some help today. And I would be help him today. Would anyone else like to help him today? But if you would just all stand up, people will walk around and take your name and, and you, help him today. So could and, you please stand and, up and, and then we'll take and other questions. And if you can't stand up, wait right just afterwards. Just stand up. Please, people, please stand up because <laughs> right. President Coppin needs help today. So if you could just stand up in the room, if you'll be on a team with me, just stand up in the room if you'll help President Coppin today because he needs help today because people are dying in his country today and that's not okay with me. Within the space of five minutes, Sharon Sharon's persuasive charms had drawn pledges of a whopping one million dollars. Unfortunately, however, a seemingly glorious achievement did little to impress the very organization she set out to benefit. After criticizing her for not doing her research into the causes and methods of preventing malaria, UNICEF were left with a bill of $750,000 to fulfill Sharon's promise of one million dollars worth of bed nets because only a quarter of the money originally pledged was ever received. The following year, she put her foot in it again by reportedly suggesting that the Sichuan earthquake, which killed 68,000 people, may have been a karmic response to China's poor treatment of the Tibetan people. Nice one, Sharon.